Hi, my name is Sam Jordan, and I am the co-president of the Carnegie New Leaders. Uh, welcome to the first of what will hopefully be many podcasts in a series with our Carnegie New Leaders. Um, to be clear, we, we have had CNLs record podcasts before, but we're hoping to make this a bit more of a regular and official series. Uh, let me give a brief explanation of what a CNL is in case um, this is your first time tuning into some of our programming, but a CNL, we're Carnegie New Leaders, and we are a group of just that, new leaders, that are interested in ethics and international affairs. Uh, we have programming and enrichment opportunities to meet with leaders in international affairs. Basically, we're a group of people that hopefully will one day be in leadership positions um, and call on each other to act ethically based on some of the education that we've received through this programming. So let's jump into it. Uh, the following is a conversation with Ilya Kersenko. He is a Carnegie New Leader from Russia, one of our very first international members, in fact. I'll give a brief bio of him and then we'll just jump right into questions. Uh, in 2014, Ilya was announced a finalist for a U.S. Government Future Leaders Exchange Program. He was granted an opportunity to come live in the U.S. with a host family and study at an American high school for a whole year to get firsthand experience of American culture and society and to come as an ambassador of dialogue and exchange between the two countries, Russia and the United States. And I think we'll probably spend some time talking about that experience because from my understanding, Ilya, it seems like that experience really shaped your perspective on ethics. So we'll get to that. Um, as mentioned, Ilya is a CNL. He is a member that is currently based in St. Petersburg, Russia. He's working towards his master's degree in philosophy at St. Petersburg State University on a dual degree program. He's conducted research on Plato's reception in the Anglo-American thought. Based on this research, he wrote his graduation thesis titled Ideal States in International Systems, where basically he dives into platonic concept of the ideal state and drives some implications for international relations based on these ideas. Ilya, did I miss anything about your impressive bio? Um, this was a great introduction. Thank you very much, Sam. No problem. So, Ilya and I, we first met, it was like right in the middle of COVID. We, um, he was in the United States for a brief period of time. So we did the social distance thing um, and had beers six feet apart at some random brew pub in DC and ended up spending hours talking about philosophy, um, specifically Plato. So Ilya, let's catch up on um, that specific topic. I know that you've read or that you've written a very long thesis on Plato and international relations. Why, why think about international affairs in the context of Plato? Well, um, Plato is our everything. If we consider the um, Western civilization, the Western culture, the Western society and the Western politics, we can imagine the whole scenario, how the Western civilization uh, has developed ever since the Greek uh, city-states emerged as the ongoing dispute between Plato and Aristotle. And this dispute between these two, the teacher and the student, um, has uh, shaped the new ideas, the new approaches that emerged in, in the um, European uh, culture and civilization and also in the uh, branches of the civilization in the, uh, in the um, dimensions uh, into which this, this uh, Greco-Roman uh, culture stretched into, including uh, uh, the United States which uh, when it was uh, founded uh, was very inspired by the um, classical uh, culture. The founding fathers read uh, the Roman Stoics. They uh, were inspired by the virtues and the values of, um, of understanding of what's good, what's just, 
And um, this is exactly what uh, the questions that Plato posed uh, to himself living in the fifth uh, century before uh, Christ uh, during a very dynamic uh, time in um, the history of Athens. Uh, this is the, uh, the time uh, called uh, as the golden age of uh, Pericles, uh, the Periclean democracy, the experiment when we can trust uh, the citizens, the free citizens of a city uh, self-governance. And, and Plato uh, during his life experienced the uh, decadence of this democracy uh, because uh, in the um, uh, war with Sparta, Athens lost to a very disciplined, very organized, uh, very uh, militaristic in our modern understanding uh, uh, state. Um, and Plato was uh, uh, very, um, very concerned about what is um, eventually the way to good and uh, uh, peaceful governance. Um, so, so we can imagine the Republic as being one of his key um, dialogues uh, that he wrote to address the nature of the good state. And what interests us um, in regards to international relations is the logic that Plato uh, builds. He says that a state is made out of groups of people and groups of people are made of individual people. And we have to understand what is an individual person? What is the nature of an individual person? Is this a kind person? Is this a cruel person? Um, and, and so Plato um, assigns the qualities to an individual. He says that an individual can be either a democratic individual or a tyrannical individual or an oligarchic individual or an aristocratic individual. And uh, he says that uh, whatever is the majority of these individuals that form a state, this is the nature of the state. So if 90% um, of the people who live in a state are democratic citizens, this will be a democratic state. And if 90% uh, of them are of tyrannical nature, this is a tyrannical state. Uh, and how Plato defines it is, is through uh, conversations that try to define what's justice, what's, what's the good, um, how can we measure it, how can we practice it. And um, I, I saw that um, line that could be drawn from an individual to a group of individuals, from a group of individuals to a state, and that international relations is the relations between the, uh, in, in the group of states. Um, and that, and that really amazed me uh, reading that, uh, that Plato's Republic on a lockdown, uh, because I, I felt that Plato would have wanted to extend that if he lived in our times uh, and he saw how uh, interconnected the world was, he would probably uh, want to uh, ask himself how, um, what is the nature of an international system? Can an international system be tyrannical or democratic or oligarchic? Uh, so that's how I saw that uh, connection between Plato and international relations. How would you describe internationals now, the, the international relations now, would you say that it's one that is democratic or tyrannical? Maybe it's a little mixture, maybe it's in transition. What do you think? Well, um, I would, um, before uh, thinking of, of the system in 2021, I, we have a clear example uh, between us, uh, uh, in front of us, uh, sorry, the um, Cold War uh, context uh, where we had one strong uh, state that uh, represented itself as a democracy. And we had uh, one other strong state that was uh, represented uh, in the um, US uh, political discourse as a, as a tyranny, as a state of uh, op oppression um, and uh, not a free uh, state. Uh, we live in the postmodern uh, era, in the postmodern context when interpretation has uh, uh, value uh, by, by the way that it is interpreted. And 
definitely within the United States intellectual framework, uh, this was the case. Uh, the, uh, the way the Cold War was portrayed was that a democracy, a democracy was fighting uh, against um, uh, a tyrannical state. And in this case, uh, Plato writes uh, on this. Uh, he writes about a situation when a democratic individual is faced uh, to a tyrannical individual. He describes the scenario for their relationships as uh, definitely lack of trust. Uh, he says that they would invest all of their efforts and time into building walls to protect one another. He says that if they live in houses next door, they would try to secure their houses and they would invest so much of their efforts into it that they would miss out a chance to build a good neighborhood. Um, as, as they would, um, a, a democratic individual would build this good neighborhood with another democratic individual because between the two um, identical beings, there is no, no need to, to build walls and feel insecure because there is predictability. And uh, coming back to our international system today, uh, this is something that, uh, seems to me uh, that is lacking the predictability um, on, on the both sides. Again, uh, if we go back into the Russian uh, intellectual framework, the situation was, uh, was different. Uh, the Soviet Union was portrayed and uh, described as the state that was liberating nations, not only within the borders of the Soviet Union, but uh, in Africa, in Asia, that was giving them freedoms uh, through the socialistic uh, uh, policy. And uh, the United States was described as the uh, state of oppression through capitalism. So these two discourses were uh, locked within one another. And uh, what we know was on the international system was the uh, uh, local uh, military conflicts. We never had the direct military uh, collision of, of the US and the USSR, but uh, we had these uh, military, um, local military conflicts like in Vietnam, like in Afghanistan, like in Korea, when if one side was supporting uh, either the uh, South Korean um, armed forces, the other side would immediately uh, support the opposite one, just to keep that balance. And what concerns me actually is that the United Nations system was built on, uh, the, on this balance uh, of strong states that could control their uh, uh, surrounding territories. This was the ideal of uh, President Roosevelt, who, um, uh, who wanted uh, uh, the Soviet Union, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom and China and possibly France to be these uh, guard keepers uh, who could take responsibility for the, their neighbors and thus secure peace and cooperate. So a lot of things change in, now, in nowadays and this uh, situation of change causes us to think philosophically too, just like the changing context uh, forced Plato to philosophy. I want to go back to um, something that you said just at the beginning of that question, which was about the nature of, of trust. Um, something that you and I have spoken about before is um, it's, it's the allegory of the cave, right? Plato's allegory of the cave. Um, and something that I just thought about because I know that there, you know, you you have some connection to that allegory, and we can get into that in a second. But I was thinking about how, with that allegory, maybe both sides thought that they were the ones that were freed from the cave, um, but they did a really bad job of communicating with each other about these ideas. So, so maybe maybe we could just kind of briefly describe the allegory of the cave, and then we can draw some more parallels. Um, to that and international relations. So do you, do you wanna go ahead and just kind of summarize the allegory of the cave? Absolutely, for, for sure. Um, I, I think that the allegory of the cave uh, 
it's it's a very interesting perspective in which you um, um, you mention it that um, this uh, this um, the, the the thing about the allegory of the cave is that behind the uh, those who observe the uh, things portrayed are are those who uh, put themselves in charge of of showing those images, and of course. Uh, pla Plato brings the allegory of the cave in the Republic as a um, as his aspiration for a person of a philosophical nature. He does not uh, expect every uh, next uh, uh, citizen, every next person, to be a philosopher. He says that getting out into the uh, open space, open light, is very painful for the eyes, and not everyone can uh, handle that light. So a lot would prefer. Uh, coming back to the state uh, uh, down in, in the cave. Um, and it's very interesting uh, to remember then what role Plato assigns to a philosopher in his ideal state. Um, he says that an ideal state should be governed uh, by philosophers, that they should be educated uh, since a very young age uh, to live in uh, modesty, so free from um, desires, uh, free from uh, passions that could uh, connect us with our earthly lives. Uh, so our ambitions to collect uh, uh, wealth um, or um, pursue um, a family relationship. He uh, really uh, wants to um, isolate the philosophers so that they can be um, completely um, neutral possibly to the interests of, 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 of the state, but then still see the light of uh, wisdom, Sophia, truth, um, and be able to uh, maybe uh, check the time in, in which the state is, is moving probably. Um, and I, I can bring an uh, image of, a, uh, of, of those persons who stand on top of a deck uh, uh, on a ship that's sailing and they have always, uh, they must always see the direction into which it's sailing. So they're um, the navigators, you're saying philosophers are like the navigators of the, uh, ship, where the ship is a country or a state. Right. And, and also regarding the, uh, the, um, uh, the cave, uh, I was just opening that, uh, that page from, from the thesis where I wrote, uh, I, I have the, uh, the whole uh, cave allegory inserted into, into the thesis and then I'm adding some comments. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it reminds us of illusions and our uh, susceptibility to illusions, how easy we are to take one thing for another. Um, I, and this is a, a, a clear tool of, of propaganda as well um, that, uh, and, and there I have, a, I have that case in, uh, after the world war was over. Um, so basically before the second world war, uh, started, the United States and the Soviet Union had uh, a, a tense relationship uh, doctrinated by their um, um, divergent uh, views upon uh, wealth, upon uh, the role of capital in a state, private property, uh, individual freedoms. Um, it is indeed uh, peculiar to me how in the 20th century, the two countries could come that uh, opposite um, and, and, and then in whose interests was it to keep them that opposite because during the 19th century we know uh, quite a normal uh, and, and a very positive relationship between the two countries. Um, I think it was uh, Catherine uh, the Great who uh, was um, ambitious to support the American War of Independence sending the uh, uh, certain regiments uh, into the United States to help George Washington fight. Uh, um, uh, and also uh, President Lincoln and Alexander II had a very good and close uh, uh, relationship on the high level. So to me, it is indeed uh, amazing how history uh, turns, can turn out and what uh, things can it play with us. Nobody, I think, could predict the 20th century to develop uh, the way it did. Um, and then again, 
this is about the huge role of propaganda that that played in educating our societies what to think because when the uh, second world war uh, emerged and the united states uh, aided uh, the soviet union through the land lease program uh, commissioning uh, military equipment so that the uh, red army could uh, get um, um, technical uh, uh, pr provision that that was vital for uh, standing up to the uh, enemy the us propaganda had to immediately uh, within within days explain to the average uh, american citizen why does the american industry support the soviet army now and that had to be done very quickly uh, in the context of war and then after the war was over and there was the image of a strong alliance between the soviet uh, union and the united states fighting the common enemy, the Nazi Germany that was um, threatening the um, further development of the uh, humanitarian civilization in, in the West. Um, there was the Cold War, uh, may, in many ways doc dictated by the real politic, by, by this urgent uh, strife for uh, geopolitical influence and, and that affected again the relationship between the two countries. And then again, the propaganda had to portray different images of one and other countries. So isn't that the, the cave <laughs> um, allegory? Right, right. Well, I'm thinking about the, um, you know, I have that propaganda poster, that, that Russian propaganda poster. It says, Niboltai, and which, which means something like, don't talk, like, yeah, I could probably show you the image, but it, it's basically like it's the it's the woman doing that, um, and you know, putting her finger to her lips, and it's the same thing as the U.S. version, which is loose lips sink ships. Um, we have that propaganda that was going around at the same time, so it's very interesting that it's like literally the same. It's it's the same message, um, but for very different audiences. Later in your paper, you know, now, now that we've kind of talked about the, the Cold War and how Plato may have been able to, if only we had read Plato a little bit more closely, maybe we could have predicted the Cold War. Um, I know that you talk about Nietzsche a little bit in your paper. Could you, could you speak to that a little bit more? Um, and what does Nietzsche have to do with international relations between US and Russia? Uh, right. Um, have to, um, the thing with writing papers is that uh, <laughs> sometimes I can forget the, the things I wrote uh, myself and that helps uh, uh, searching through keywords. Um, I, 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 I think that Nietzsche was, all right, uh, I remember now. Nietzsche was brought into the paper because I wanted to connect the um, time of Plato with our time, with the uh, postmodern era. Uh, it, it's a complicated uh, thing. Uh, what is postmodern, uh, especially in politics? And I remember I was 14 years old and I was on YouTube trying to understand what was postmodern. And I saw that video that gave me examples. Postmodern is when the classical diplomacy rules can be uh, trespassed. So when we see a president, a head of state on the United Nations General Assembly, uh, taking off his or her shoe and just setting it on the deck, maybe to demonstrate something to us, that's, that's quite not classical diplomacy. That's uh, violating these uh, courteous um, goods, uh, uh, sorry, uh, rule of good tone or when a head of state comes up to give a speech at the General Assembly smoking uh, drugs. Uh, that's, uh, that's what's postmodern politics. And we live in the, in the, in the time of postmodern politics when, when a lot of uh, political exchanges are carried out through Twitter. Uh, Twitter, since when it is uh, official diplomatic uh, correspondence. Uh, I mean, we, we have to accept the reality 
I think quicker than we can even have time to ask questions. And I mentioned Nietzsche because he was uh, one of those philosophers who predicted the course in which the 20th century would develop. Uh, and he, he mentioned, uh, we know one of his famous phrases that God is uh, dead. Uh, there are many interpretations what that means, uh, God is dead. That's, that's not only uh, 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 referring to the uh, real, real God uh, that we imagine. Um, I, uh, I bring that um, interpretation in my thesis. A man, uh, a human being is, a, is, is someone in between on the line from nature to God. Uh, we are not really monkeys from which Darwin says we came from, but we are not also really close to, uh, to what God is because we are still attached to earth. We, our existence is very short. We are not as powerful as a definition of God is. So we are in between. And, uh, and if, if Nietzsche says that uh, God is that, maybe he means that our attempt to become the, uh, the, the beings, the moral beings that we, that we were taught to be are, are extinct, these attempts. He, he, he proposes the uh, theory of being a superhuman. So to oversee it, us and, and become the thinkers of a new level, free from prejudices of the past, uh, able to uh, maybe even look beyond the dogmas, beyond the propaganda. And, and what, what was interesting to me is that the nature is also in the risk of being dead. And I bring that in the context of climate change, of our destructive influence upon the environment in the certain aspect. It's of course still a long-term uh, process to see whether we are actually able to kill the nature that uh, gave birth to us. Uh, but, but even if we do, we're also intelligent enough to, to build an ecosystem of our own. We don't depend on sunlight anymore. We can, we can have our light 24 hours a day through electricity. So, so to me, it was very interesting to see the, the path that we are walking and to measure it with what Nietzsche thought for us to walk. Uh, are we close to Nietzsche's expectations or we are walking in another directions, direction? Is there anything you can say, and if not, we, we can move on, but <clears throat> is there anything you can say about, like, about technology and, and either Plato or Nietzsche? Well, um, Right, um, technology. I know, I know this wasn't in your paper. I'm just, I'm just kind of thinking about, um, you know, so much has obviously changed since 300 BC, <laughs> um, and has technology changed any interpretations of Plato, or, or mm. maybe has technology refuted some some of the things that we thought to be the universal truths because of Plato. This question is actually fundamental to my thesis, I, I think, because it starts with a question, is, the, uh, is international relations science or is it art? Um, can, we, can we measure the international relations uh, just as we measure Earth in uh, time zones and, and, and can predict the way that the international relations develop? Or is it art and is there a lot about inspiration, about a significant human um, factor to it Be because uh, the heads of states uh, uh, change and certain heads of state impact the international relations. So basically is a person like Gorbachev in the Soviet Union, uh, was, was it inevitable that someone like Gorbachev would come to power in late 19, uh, in, in 1980s? Um, or it's, it's, chance, it's chance. So the way that the history developed further on is attributed to the personality of Gorbachev. The similar, uh, we can recall back to Plato uh, when per Pericle lost his influence 
was it inevitable that this was the fate of democracy? It, it was quite a short period of time of democracy in Athens, about 40 years, uh, but um, that was the time when uh, Athens uh, flourished. All the wealth of the, of the Grecian world came to Athens through Athens. Athens was the bank, uh, the storage of the ancient world. And, and that's how the philosophers came into Athens and that's how philosophy developed. So science then walks its individual path uh, a lot uh, since the age of enlightenment. We tend to trust scientific methods even more than uh, the methods of um, intuition because uh, our feelings can fault us uh, and it seems like our measures don't. But then it's, it's critical how science impacts uh, philosophy and uh, a scientific discovery uh, uh, encourages philosophers to think uh, in the ways in, in which this discovery uh, develops. And I want to uh, bring the uh, book by uh, uh, Trueblood uh, titled The Dawn of the Postmodern Era, uh, where he says that the 20th century, one of the greatest marks of the 20th century is the split of atom uh, that uh, in science that brings us to the nuclear energy and also to the most destructive uh, weapon on earth that was the factor of the uh, Cold War uh, competition too, uh, arms race and po uh, politics too. Uh, but then uh, if we saw scientifically uh, most evidently that we can split the unsplittable because atom uh, from Greek, uh, they titled it atom because it's, it's the fundamental. It's something that can not be split further on. And then in 20th century, it turns out that yes, it's, it can be split. So we lose grounds upon our feet, uh, uh, below our feet, sorry. We, we then again don't realize what is our being, what is the universe that we live on. And uh, being able to split, practicing the split of atom in science also leads us to thinking, can we split the worst uh, in human nature from the best and leave only the best in us? Will we still be humans or will we lose one of the most important parts of ours? So I think that's the, that's the uh, style in which I would picture uh, the, the most um, uh, um, urgent uh, question that we have uh, in correlation between philosophy and science uh, in, in our age. I wanna make sure that we leave some time for you to talk about your, your background a bit more um, in coming to the United States. Could you talk about that experience and how that shaped your views mm -hmm. on ethics and philosophy. Okay, okay. Well, the reason why I'm studying philosophy is because it's, it's the most practical thing I've ever done in my life. Philosophy is to me uh, in, in no way theoretical because I, I would not need to uh, spend time, take it out of uh, earning, uh, earning money or fulfilling my social duties, you know, taking isolated time to read something and to write something if it wasn't applicable to my life and to my uh, personality. So uh, I always wanted to practice things that I believed in. Uh, and there are not so many things that I end up believing in. I, I keep uh, seeing alternatives. I keep <laughs> doubting myself, questioning myself. So I went to philosophy, uh, I went to the United States uh, on the level of uh, when I wasn't still very a very conscious person. I was 16, and that's a very crucial age when you just uh, begin to make your own mind on things. And here's an interesting thing. I think that I first understood what America was before I understood what Russia was. Because when, if, and I, and I think if I only lived in Russia, I would never, uh, I would never see what, what can be different in the world. And then I would not be able to understand neither my own country, nor the countries that surround it. And when I went to the United States, uh, one of the philosophical discoveries for me that brought me 
a lot of sleepless nights and some of the things I, I regret, I regret to have them because then it makes you not be so quick to believe into things. In Russia, you take shoes off when you enter a house. And then in the United States, you don't always do so. That was a big culture shock for me because I know that if I come into my house in Russia in my shoes, my grandmother or my mother or my father, they would say, oh, take them off. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, well, the reason why I think in the US, you, you don't need to take your shoes off because it's usually clean outside on the streets too. Uh, here in Russia, when spring comes or winter or fall, it's, it's a very uh, dirty time of the year, uh, but that impacts culture. Or in other cases, when I was sick in the United States, when I had fever, uh, my, my host family told me that I was uh, probably tired and I needed to just uh, take time to rest and drink a lot of water. Uh, cold water, which is never the case in Russia, because uh, in Russia, we believe that we have to drink uh, warm drinks, not cool drinks. And these simple differences, they make a mind of a 16 year old boy really confused. How can this be so opposite on the other uh, edge of the globe, but still the nation lives and prospers and everything's going good. So so is this then the case of attitude and, and that a lot of the things can be both true uh, and it's maybe the way that we build our own vision, our own attitude to things. And that made me, um, that made me um, be um, acceptive uh, of differ differences that surround me. Plus uh, the aspect of the flex program is that you don't get to choose where to go. Um, on the first side, on the stereotypical level, a lot of Russian kids would love ending up in San Francisco or Los Angeles or Florida <laughs> or New York. And uh, they would never consider many, many of other places that also make part of the United States. And the rules of the FLEX program is that it's a lottery. Uh, you don't get to decide where to go, but all of the 50 states, you can end up in any of the 50 states and in any family. My close friend ended up in a family of uh, video game designers in Las Vegas, and yeah. she was going to these uh, parties uh, every Saturday. Um, other kids end up on a, a ranch in Texas and uh, spend time looking after horses and just enjoying the rural lifestyle. Well, I ended up in, uh, in Mississippi, and uh, to me first, this was a challenge because I couldn't relate uh, a lot of things that I, I learned uh, about Mississippi before. And I understand what a treasure it is to my identity, to my biography now that someone in Russia can understand Mississippi on such an intimately close level. And I can, that's something I really believe in because I can close my eyes and imagine the main street of Aberdeen right now Northeast Mississippi, and I can tell you who's sitting where, who's doing what, what stores are open, what stores are closed. And, and this is my heartbeat, this is my DNA. I uh, enjoy going back there. Uh, it, it feels like I'm someone who lived there, someone who grew there and who's coming back home after a long time. I, I, uh, I absolutely love this. And I, I, I don't think that there are many Russians who took Mississippi so close to their heart. And it's, it's, it's precious to be someone who can say something new or feel something uh, and express that. So if, when I say that the United States and Russia uh, have um, uh, reasons and objectives to be in dialogue, uh, understand one another and engage, uh, I, I mean myself uh, first of all, and I, I mean for myself going to Mississippi and 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 being there, um, kind of sewing that dress for myself so that I can wear it. Um, so so 
that's very important to my uh, to my identity uh, that I got that privilege to learn about the United States when I was just 16. I understand that if I went there at the age of 21, 23, this might not have been the same experience. I came there very open, very flexible, and I was endlessly willing to accept many, many of the things that seemed different to me. And I'm very grateful that I have done that. I realized that now I might not have been able to do that because now I have, my identity is building more and more. I uh, test some things with experience. And when some people tell me, you have to do this, I might say, well, I've done that before. I know that it's not as good for me as doing this. Uh, but um, I, and that gave me a, an opportunity to take the United States very uh, naturally. I, I don't think I'm uh, building illusions to myself when I say that I understand the United States, that I can feel uh, the United States and the different, different persons, uh, people that, who live there. I can understand their values. I can understand what's important to them in their life. Uh, probably because I can relate to them because I lived in host families that became uh, second families to me. And, and with time, I only appreciate uh, being careful of these relations, caring for them. And uh, I, I really hope to, to um, be that, uh, that voice uh, in this time that can um, explain the United States uh, uh, here in Russia and uh, maybe open the windows that have been closed for uh, so many uh, decades. <laughs> okay. That was, great. That, was, that was so good to hear. Um, in a way, I, I can kind of relate to this, but on a, on a different level, certainly nowhere, in a, you know, as far distance between Mississippi and Russia, but, you know, I, I grew up in Salina, Kansas, which is very different than where I live now, which is New York City. Um, and something that we've seen in the U.S. is that people in the in the Midwest and the South um, feel very distant to the, the people on the coasts and, and, and vice versa. Um, and it seems it seems to me that you know if only we could have even even like domestic exchange programs for 16 year olds between New York City and Salina, Kansas, then I think people would come to realize that it actually is easy, maybe not easy, but it is possible to understand the different perspectives. You know, there's this thing, it's like a lot of people on the coasts think, well, people in Mississippi, you know, they just don't understand. They, you know, if only, if only they, they could live the city life, then, then they would understand why, you know, people on the coasts vote a certain way and vice versa. You know, only someone from Los Angeles could spend time in Salina, then maybe they could understand why they voted um, or, or think a certain way. Um, which is not to say that, you know, necessarily there's going to be adoption of these values, but being able to understand someone's perspective is important. So I'll, I'll ask my final question for you based on that, which is uh, what is one thing that you wish people in the US knew about Russia? And what is one thing that you wish people in Russia understood about the US? That's a beautiful question. And so to the point of uh, what I would really want to say in this podcast, but uh, I wouldn't have come myself to it. Um, be before I say that, the, uh, the founding gardeners, there's a book, The Founding Gardeners, that talks about the founding fathers and their uh, uh, attitude to gardening as a philosophical activity. Um, and in that book, I learned that these uh, mm, opposition between a, a city and a rural area in, in the United States is one of the uh, founding, uh, founding um, factors. Uh, 
because even George Washington didn't want to be the president before he was asked uh, officially and many times. He really appreciated his independent uh, stoic living on his uh, um, um, estate uh, where he enjoyed uh, a lot of uh, individual uh, activities, planting, uh, trying different cultures, seeds, uh, and uh, he wouldn't understand the uh, thinking in the cities. Cities live on trade and uh, rural areas live on uh, manufacture and labor uh, back then and still now. Uh, and I think that the reason why this is such a um, lively, uh, lively uh, polemic uh, in the United States is because it's a very conscious country. It's because both the rural um, areas are represented politically uh, and, and socially and they understand the, the values of their living and they are ready to stand up for them and to appreciate them. Uh, and also the uh, urban uh, areas, the, the major US uh, cities, Philadelphia, New York, uh, Boston, if we, if we talk about those uh, during the time the nation was founded. And, and then what, now to your question, uh, what was uh, something I would want uh, Russians to learn about Americans um, is probably how similar, uh, how similar we are uh, and to know on what particular levels we are very similar. And, and that's also to understand and admit, and I think every, every person is different uh, too. Um, and uh, every person defines um, what's close, what's not so close to oneself through individual experience. And I wish that exercise for, um, if not everyone, for, for, for the many people who want to participate in the bilateral dialogue between Russia and the United States. Um, I'm, I'm curious uh, that the people who are in charge of our uh, politics, uh, they may um, not be uh, thinking that way. They may not be um, approaching these, uh, this relationship with these values, with this uh, determination. But politics is, uh, is the sphere probably above the capacities of an individual to uh, influence it. Uh, though ideas can influence a lot, our individual uh, writing uh, exchange and experience can, I think, uh, make progress. And, and if we share these ideas uh, publicly. And then what I would wish for the United, uh, for, for the Americans to learn about Russians, um, well, a, a lot of things probably, including even just traveling over here and uh, spending significant amount of time uh, in this environment, uh, discovering that it's a country just like any other uh, with inevitable um, activities like waking up in the morning, having breakfast all together, everyone going to work, uh, coming back home, then picking up kids from school, uh, maybe and just having dinner to all together individually, watching TV, uh, going to sleep, spending weekends, just seeing that life is very similar in, in, in many places and uh, actually discovering how similar to the United States Russia is today. Uh, I, I'm surprised how in this um, 23 years, um, Roughly saying, uh, the the Soviet Union. I uh, on on a life basis, I don't see it, uh, and that's that that was something that was very different, maybe from the U, from the U.S. Uh, way of life. But modern Russia is trying to be capitalistic, trying to be uh, a country like like other countries. Though there are things that make it special and different. And, and I just wish, yes, uh, commitment to, to be interested in one another and, and uh, extending the dialogue. I can't think of a better way to end it because that's exactly what we want to do with this podcast, right? Which is extend the dialogue, understand each other's perspectives. 
Um, I really cannot think of a better person to have this first inaugural, a uh, more official CNL podcast with. Um, we always have great conversations and this one proved to be another beautiful um, thought-provoking conversation. So thank you, or spasiba. Spasiba, is that right? Spasiba, pajalsta. Thank you very much, Sam, uh, for your questions and for listening to, to the answers I tried to, to, to give. Uh, it was a pleasure.